Have you ever wondered what would happen if a serial killer was left to roam free in a small town? This is exactly what happened in the case of the Missoula Mauler, who was known to friends and family as Wayne Nance. He managed to live a double life of a serial killer and an average Joe for more than a decade before he was brought to his ultimate demise. Though what makes this case unique is that Wayne's crimes would never be brought to light while alive. He remained the average Joe to everyone around him until his sudden death unrelated to his serial killings. With more than 10 known victims under his belt, Wayne Nance is considered to be one of the most prolific serial killers to live in Montana between 1974 and 1986. Nance went home to home, murdering innocent citizens and slipping into the shadows before anyone could trail his scent. He only ever came out of hiding long enough to take another life. Welcome back to another episode of Twisted Minds. My name is James and today we'll be breaking down the story of Wayne Nance, the prowling murderer of the 80s who haunted the citizens of Missoula. He has been dubbed the Missoula Mauler for the violent and grotesque nature of his crimes. Let's get into it, shall we? Born on the 18th of October, 1955, the mysterious man known as Wayne Nance had always shown signs of being an outlier. His father was a simple truck driver, and his mother worked as a waitress in a local restaurant. Nance was a strange child, put it best. He grew up in a mobile home outside the town of Missoula, and he began to pick up interests in things other children would consider downright scary. Despite all this, the youngster excelled in school, which helped to ease his mother's mind about his other behaviors. She probably assumed it was part of the ups and downs of a developing child, something she thought her son would grow out of by the time he became a teenager. Unfortunately for her and a couple of other unlucky souls, the behavioral pattern continued into his teens. During that time, he was widely considered a weirdo for his extracurricular activities. Nan Nance always boasted of his worship of Satan, even going as far as branding himself with satanic symbols using a coat hanger. These troubling signs seemed to disappear when he became an adult, as by age 30, he looked as though he worked through most of the problems he battled with in his younger days. His act was so watertight that his employers and co-workers were impressed by him, as they would describe him as something of an average guy who looked harmless. Sadly, history would not remember him as such. Wayne Nance was a special case in the realm of serial killers because the beginning of his story starts with his end. The sadistic killer had managed to evade capture and recognition for a very long time by taking advantage of the fact that he lived in Missoula, which was a relatively small town in Montana. In Missoula, Wayne Nance worked at a furniture moving company owned and managed by a man, Doug Wells. In his time at the furniture moving company, Nance got used to seeing the manager's wife, Chris Wells, walk in and out of the office. She paid regular visits to her husband, as they were both involved in building the company from the ground. Nance began to develop something of an obsession for Chris. Maybe it was the thirst for the forbidden fruit, or perhaps she was so beautiful that he couldn't help but develop an attraction for her. We may never know. All we know is that he began to grow resentful of Chris throughout his deep attraction. These feelings were so strong that they began to overwhelm him. Eventually, he decided to take action. His plan was simple. He was going to make her suffer, and afterward, get rid of her and her husband. Fast forward to the 4th of September, 1986. We are now at the Wells Mansion, and it is a cool night in the suburbs. Doug Wells takes a look outside, and much to his surprise, he spots someone hiding in the bushes in front of his house. Being a man of action, Doug decided to go outside and confront the stalker. When he discovered that it was his employee, Wayne Nance, Doug let his guard down. After questioning Nance, Doug's employee gave an explanation for hiding in the bushes. According to Nance, he had spotted someone peering into the house while he was driving by. He claimed that he had merely stopped over to investigate and bring the perpetrator to justice. Nance then asked Wells if he could borrow a flashlight so they could search for this petty offender. Doug Wells obliged him. When he turned around to get into the house, Nance seized the opportunity and struck Doug in the head with the butt of his pistol. Doug was dazed. The deep scalp wound had already started to bleed. Lead. But luckily, he did not lose consciousness. He pounced on Nance, realizing finally that his strange employee was the villain after all. They struggled from the garage into the house, all the while making a lot of noise, which brought Chris Wells to the scene. While they were locked in combat, Nance managed to get a hold of a length of pipe, which he used to finally prevail over his opponent. This was going to be a long night for the Wells family. After this, 
He brought out his pistol and once again threatened Chris with it. He made her walk upstairs and slowly they made their way to the couple's bedroom. Nance then tied her up to the bedpost before going downstairs to finish the job he started. He dragged Doug to the basement and tied him to a post with a clothesline. Doug had been bound and nearly beaten to death, but this was not enough for Nance. He went upstairs to get an eight inch kitchen knife, which he used to stab Doug in the chest, puncturing one of his lungs. Nance did not know it, but he had missed Doug's heart by about an inch. Nance then left his victim to die in the basement. Finally, feeling he was free to have his way with Chris. It was after this that Doug, pumped full of adrenaline, managed to muster enough strength to break free from his restraints. Doug had a hobby of collecting antique guns, and earlier he had placed a lever action Savage Model 99G rifle near his workstation in the basement. If he could get his hands on it, he would have a chance of saving his wife from this murderous psychopath. Through sheer willpower and despite injuries that would normally kill a man, Doug managed to walk to the Savage and load it with a single bullet, which was all he had available. It was time to put an end to this. Doug knew that if he rushed into the room without caution, Nance might use Chris as a human shield. So he decided to try a different strategy. He banged the butt of his rifle against the wall to get Nance's attention. The ruse worked. Nance dashed back toward the basement stairs and Doug let him have it with the Savage as soon as he saw him. Both males were hit when they traded bullets. Chris, on the other hand, had managed to free herself save for one arm. Hearing the shot, she assumed Nance had murdered her husband. Doug managed to stumble up the steps and Seeing the injured Nance attempted to stand, continued to pound him with the rifle's butt as he crawled into the bedroom. Nance was now within striking distance of the still tethered Chris, who began to kick and punch him. Nance managed to reach his revolver, and then he turned around to shoot Doug. His shot caught his manager just above the knee, but that was not enough to stop Doug, who was determined to bring this killer down. Doug Wells knocked the lamp off the bedside table in the process, leaving the room in complete darkness. In the pitch black darkness of the room, Doug heard another shot, and as he ran for the table where he kept another weapon, he activated the overhead light switch. Doug realized that Nance had shot himself. He was on the floor convulsing and trembling. They managed to call the police, and the three of them were rushed to the hospital, where Doug surprisingly made a full recovery. His wife, Chris, was not physically harmed during the altercation. For Nance, however, his injuries proved fatal. He died in the hospital the following day. Nance was never formally accused, tried, or convicted of any crime before his death. In the wake of the historical confrontation between Doug Wells and Wayne Nance, the police opened a file on this deranged attacker. Authorities quickly realized that this was not an isolated incident involving Nance. What they found at the end of their investigation was a tangled web of violence and murder stretching over a decade. The bind and slash approach used by Wayne Nance reminded local detectives of an unsolved case from 1974. They would soon discover that Wayne Nance committed his first murder at the age of 18 for unknown reasons. On April 11th, 1974, he broke into Harvey Pounds' home while the Bethel Baptist Church deacon was at work. Unfortunately, his wife Donna was home alone. Nance, as a frequent guest and family acquaintance, knew exactly where the Pounds 22 caliber Luger was. He crept into Donna's bedroom and fetched the revolver before tying her up and taking sexual advantage of her at gunpoint. He then dragged her into the basement and chained her to a chair before shooting five bullets into her brain. While a neighbor saw Nance near the house that night, the information was useless. Years later, authorities investigated Nance's residence and discovered evidence linking him to Pound's murder. During the 1974 investigation, police discovered bloody underwear in the house, but they couldn't figure out where it originated from because it had been washed. Harvey Pounds found himself a suspect in his own wife's murder, and suspicion was increased by the fact that he was having an affair. Inadequate evidence against either party led the murder to becoming a cold case. This was the beginning of the Missoula Mauler's sinister career. Nance served in the United States Navy from 1974 to 1977, and investigators later thought he committed other crimes while on military duty. Detectives believe Nance is also linked to the death of a Seattle runaway who was discovered buried near Mozilla in March 1980. We may never know how many additional murders Wayne committed in the years before he pushed his luck too far because the suspect was silent. Before Nance's death and the discovery of his crimes, a few of his murders were temporarily ascribed to David 
Maya Hoffer, who was another prolific serial killer in the area. Maya Hoffer, a native of Montana and military veteran, confessed to four killings before committing suicide in custody in 1974, but officials suspected that he had committed more crimes. Nance's career blossomed in the 80s. Devonna Nelson, 15, was discovered on a road bank in Missoula in January 1980, with her body badly decomposed. Her remains were not identified until February 1985, due to the state of her body. She was dubbed Betty Beavertail before her identity was revealed. She was named after the adjacent Beavertail Hill State Park. Nance was accused of murdering Nelson, but has not been proven guilty. Nance was a bouncer at Missoula's Cabin Bar in 1984. He was also seen a 16-year-old drifter called Marcella Backman, also known as Robin. The pair stated that they would leave town in September to begin a fresh life somewhere else. Robin's body was, however, discovered in the woods of Mozilla three months later. A hiker discovered the remains of Marcella on December 24, 1984, in an advanced state of decay. The corpse had been laid to rest in a shallow grave. The police would find out that it was indeed Nance who had murdered Bachman. In Nance's residence, investigators discovered hair similar to Bachman's. She had fled Vancouver, Washington due to disagreements with her family members, only to be killed by three gunshots to the skull far away in Montana. Bachman, like Devano Nelson, was given a nickname before her identification. She was called Debbie Deer Creek after a nearby drainage basin. Her cremated remains were later buried. Bachman was last seen alive with Nance who had taken her in after a trucker in the region had abandoned her. She used the identity of Robin and claimed to be a native of Texas or to have traveled through the state. Nance stated she fled the area about the time she was slain in September 1984. Derek Bachman, her brother and a private detective, had been looking for Marcella since he was 21 years old. He first assumed that she had supported herself as a prostitute while away from home and had become a victim of Gary Ridgway. During the 1980s and 1990s, Ridgway murdered at least 49 runaway children and prostitutes. Marcella, on the other hand, was never identified as one of his victims. She was only recognized as Bachman by DNA tests in 2006, after being dubbed Debbie Deer Creek after the crime scene. Nance's body count was three and climbing. The next of his victims was Janet L. Lucas, whose skeleton was discovered on September 9, 1985 in Missoula. The autopsy revealed that she had been shot with a 32 caliber bullet in her head. According to investigators, she died between 1983 and 1985. Lucas's remains were unidentifiable until May 2021, and she was initially thought to be of Asian ancestry. Lucas, like the other Jane Doe's discovered at East Missoula, Zula was given a nickname before being identified. The name she was given was Christy Crystal Creek. Her examination revealed that she was between the ages of 18 and 35, and roughly about five to six feet in height. This identification was too vague for authorities to successfully identify the corpse at the time. Her examination revealed that she had a history of smoking and numerous fillings in her teeth, as well as two root canals. She had also had oral surgery, which involved the screwing of a dental post into the tooth, which was typical of Asian dentistry practices. Following a successful DNA extraction, genetic genealogy investigation revealed that Lucas was from Spokane, Washington, and had vanished from Sandpoint Idaho during the summer of 1983. It's unclear when or why she moved to Montana. Nance has not been proven to be the murderer, but he is the primary suspect. Now we get to the bloodiest home invasion the Mahler managed to pull off. Mike and Teresa Shook had just finished dinner with their four young children when Nance knocked. When Mike opened it, he was stabbed to death with a butcher knife, while his wife was carried into the bedroom to be sexually violated. When Nance was finished, he stabbed her to death. And then he set the house to fire to kill the children and destroy all the evidence. Thankfully, neighbors arrived before the fire could spread. While the children were discovered alive, there is no evidence of Wayne Nance or anything connecting him to the violent house invasion. Nance quickly found work at Conlin's Furniture, hidden in plain sight. He had a decent appearance and may have faded into obscurity if he hadn't quickly returned to his aggressive habits. A check of Nance's home years later brought up a hunting knife and a small porcelain statue stolen from the home of Michael and Teresa Shook, who were killed in nearby Hamilton, Montana in December 1985. In the end, it was the courageous couple Nance had failed to kill who eventually put an end to his six victim crime spree, not the cops. Wayne Nance's last felony was breaking into his boss's house. Despite the fact that Nance thrust an eight inch blade into Doug's chest, beat him over the head, and nearly took sexual advantage of his wife, both Doug and Chris survived, and Nance was shot dead. 
Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Wayne Nance. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.